The first one out of the gate this morning is Dr. Catherine Fieschi. She is the executive director at CounterPoint. She is a senior research fellow at the Institute of Global Prosperity at the UCL and a senior fellow at the London School of Economics. She has been the director of research at the British Council and director of DEMOS. Fieschi is the author of numerous journal articles as well as essays on extremism, mobilization and identity politics. And she frequently provides expert analysis for both national and international media. Dr. Fieschi, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Agenda and University of Oslo, uh, for inviting me. This is, this is definitely one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful, hall I've ever spoken in. And to thank you, I'm going to give you one of the most depressing talks you've ever heard. <laughs> um, I, was, I come from Britain, which uh, explains why I need to share my depression at the moment. Um, and I've been asked to talk about populism, to take a, a macro look at the phenomenon. Um, what do these movements and parties want? Why do people vote for them? Where are we headed? And how can they best be managed or dealt with? So first, we're going to take a look at what we're talking about, um, populist movements and parties, and then um, I'm going to try and take a look at what has contributed to their success. I'm going to try and tell this um, as a little bit of a story uh, rather than more definitions and more statistics. You, you can find all this. Populism is a big topic. You can, you can find all this um, online and it's, and it's well covered. So I'm going to try and give a perspective that is a bit of a narrative about how all this um, comes together. So first of all, in the brief that I was given, um, I was asked to talk about these movements, right? Um, and it's interesting because more and more we take, all of us who study populism and who are interested in populism, we take these shortcuts, we refer to these movements, and it becomes very, very nebulous. What do we mean? Do we mean movements that go against consensus politics? Do we mean that they're anti-elitist and anti-establishment, including anti-expert, anti-intellectual, anti-cosmopolitan? Do we mean movements that are nativist or xenophobic or clearly anti-migrant or anti-immigration? Do we mean far-right movements? Or do we just mean movements that are revolts against various aspects of globalization? It's a bit of a mixed and hazy bag. And yet, we sort of know what we mean. And what we mean is this. We mean this type of leader, we mean this type of voter, and that's the shortcuts that we take. And yet, what we're dealing with um, is a very complex set of motivations, a very uh, differentiated set of voters, um, and quite a spread of different parties. In fact, for example, when we talk about right-wing populist parties, we never really know whether to include Norway's Progress Party into that, because they offer some similarities, but also some differences. It's important for the rest of the talk to say that the parties and movements that I'm looking at today are actually not far-right movements, in, in contrast to um, some of what my colleague um, Alice will, will cover. This is one of the striking points, in fact, of, of the past few years, that many parties about which we're talking are parties that have shifted over the past few years, that many of them have their roots in far-right nationalism um, and, the, and the extreme right, but they've actually changed over time. They've toned down um, their, their rhetoric. So they've moved from far-right nationalism and overt racism to something that is exclusive and chauvinistic and has a polarizing effect on the political scene, and this is something we'll come back to, but they are not radically authoritarian. They don't advocate violence against minorities, even though they do advocate exclusion or rejection 
or marginalization of those minorities. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that we will talk about later on is the fact that there is, there is a porous barrier between, you know, the far reaches of the right and the populist right-wing parties, but they're not one and the same. So we're looking at parties that we at CounterPoint have often referred to as the parties and particularly the voters that we call the reluctant radicals, right? People who don't look radical, people who have never made, you know, radical choices in their political lives, um, but in fact are perfectly happy to go along with the French Front National or with the Freedom Party um, in Austria. But they look very different from the voters of the far right that we used to know um, in the immediate after war years or even in the 1970s and 1980s. So I'm not interested in definitions for their own sake, but by not being precise enough, we sometimes see populism where it doesn't exist. So for example, in Catalonia, I hear a lot of people talking about the independentist movement as a populist movement. The Catalonian independentist movement is an identity-based movement. Um, it is a movement that is against, you know, the, the Spanish state, but it is not a populist movement. It is not exclusionary um, in, in terms of, of minorities, so we have to be careful. And on the other hand, by not being precise and not necessarily being nuanced enough about what we mean, we sometimes fail to see populism where it has existed for a long time. And in this respect, you know, the UK is a, is a fantastic um, case in point. It's interesting that up until recently, Britain was, didn't figure in the case studies on populism because there was no obvious populist party. But the reason there was no obvious populist party is because actually populist sentiment lived there. It lived in the tabloid press. These forces were invisible to those who were looking for populist parties and formal politics, but the tabloids were busy building a populist audience and a populist voter who would be receptive to a party like UKIP when it came along. So people who wouldn't touch the British National Party at all with its overt racism would go along with a party that blamed government and the elites and the elite of Europe, but didn't explicitly blame immigrants or minorities. They would blame the people who let them in and failed to manage what they saw as the problem. Over decades, these papers systematically created the suspicion that the government was incompetent, that elites were out of touch and out to get ordinary people, that there was a vast conspiracy at work to defraud the public, to rob them of their rights, to make them helpless and dependent, to undermine the aspects of national life that they held as most important and most sacred. The royal family, Christmas, pubs, the English countryside, British fishing, anything, you name it, right? It was, there was a, a set of evil and hidden elitist forces that were out to undermine all of this. So my first point is that we have to ask ourselves when we use the term populism, what we mean, but also who we mean, the voters, the parties, the leaders, the media, these are important questions. Populism is not synonymous with popular. It's not synonymous with identity politics. And it refers to a political appeal, or what I would call a political offer, that is more defined. And, and I will get to what that offer is. My second point is that we need to keep in mind that the voters and the parties are not one and the same. There are differences between the party's aims on the one hand that may be xenophobic, unethical, and radically exclusive, and the resentments and fears of voters, and how they think that their resentments and fears will be addressed, or simply made to be noticed, right, um, by these parties. It's important because while we may want to dismiss these parties, and I know that um, here this has not been the case, but while we may want to dismiss these parties in parts of, in parts of Europe, we need to hear the voters. I don't necessarily mean listen to the voters and do what they want, but we need to hear 
what it is that they're feeling and what it is that they're saying, because otherwise they won't know where else to go but these parties. Our research shows that voters are concerned about different things when you scratch beneath the surface and the headline. You know, very quickly, we've carried out comparative research on the voters for pop populist parties across Europe. And, you know, the pop pop popular notion is that it's only about um, immigration. But the fact is that when you scratch beneath the surface, what you get in France, for example, is something that is very different. It's actually a resentment about feeling disconnected from public services, about no longer feeling that you have a stake in the more urban and vibrant parts of the country and that you're being discarded almost literally geographically, right? So it has a particular flavor. In the Netherlands, where we have a particularly strident uh, leader, there too, when you scratch beneath the surface, yes, of course, immigration is often a shorthand for what people are feeling, but actually what you, what you notice is that it's a feeling of anxiety, it's a feeling of nostalgia, nostalgia for consensus, nostalgia for a certain type um, of community life. So there's more to it than simply um, the headlines. And, um, one of the other things is that just like voters vary across countries, we have to be aware of thinking that voters for populist parties are the same within one country. So if I think of France, for example, the French Front National actually has two very different electorates. One electorate that is petit bourgeois, conservative, and based in the South, and one electorate that is actually much more lower middle class, working class, that is based in the North and in parts of France that have been deindustrialized. They're motivated by some similar motivations, but also different ones. And Britain is a really important part of this story in terms of the differences, the subtle differences between stories, be, um, between voters, sorry. If you look at the map that's on your left, um, you have the story that is being told, that is being peddled, which is one that there are two Britons Right? Um, so first of all, it's a very polarizing story, right? Two camps, almost of equal weight, but not quite. Um, and you have essentially what is being argued as, you know, an England that voted to leave and a Scotland that voted to stay, except for urban areas. But actually, it's important to look at a more detailed map. And if you look at the more detailed map here on the, on the right, you'll see that actually there are real nuances. There are places where leave barely got in or where remain barely got in and where actually voters are far more mixed than that. It also shows that, you know, it's not strictly driven by economics. So this idea that it's poor Britain that voted to leave, that actually doesn't make any sense because in some ways Scotland is a far more poor area than the rest of, of Britain, and yet they voted to remain. So I think we have to be careful and we have to take these things um, into account. What they do all share, these voters, however, is that uh, they all display relatively lower levels of education. This is true in the United States and it's true across Europe um, and it's true across the different countries um, in Europe. But beyond the differences in the voters, which I think we need to take into account, there's, it's absolutely clear that the politics and the parties that we're interested in, the politics that we're examining today, share a core appeal. They make a distinct political offer to the voters. And it's actually pretty consistent across different places. So here's the message that they give, and I've put it up for you. The story that populist parties and populist leaders give you is that the current government and the rest of an imagined elite, intellectuals, experts, bankers, the media, note that this elite isn't necessarily an economic elite. It's, it's also a cultural elite. This elite wants to make you believe that they are governing and wielding power in your interest when in fact they only have their own separate interests at heart. It doesn't matter, they say, whether they say that they're, they're on the left or on the right. This is just to manipulate you. Think, for example, of 
Donald Trump's idea of you know, draining the swamp, right? Whether they're Democratic or, or Republican, on the left or on the right, that doesn't make any difference. This emphasis on left and right is to distract you from the fact that actually, as an elite, they're all the same. Left and right don't matter. And the story goes, they're not like you and me. They are no longer part of the real people, the real nation. They no longer have the interests of ordinary people at heart. And this is where the reasoning comes in. The reasoning is because these people have more in common with each other as an elite than they have in common with the voters who put them there. This is why populist parties argue they like the EU, they let migrants in, or they get caught up about debates and minorities, and they hide behind technocracy and often about behind complexity. They just care about maintaining their own lifestyles at whatever cost to you. It is a conspiracy against the people. This is a story that is designed to show that ordinary people are the custodians of common sense, right? Whereas the elite and the intellectuals overcomplicate matters. It's also a story designed to highlight that the way that politics is done, technocratically, based on compromise, based on promise, on process and on reasoning, that that actually is wrong. That real politics should be gut politics. The US campaign for Barry Goldwater in 1964, I think is a good illustration of this, right? In your heart, you know his right. You don't need to use your head, right? And then I loved, you know, my favorite rebuttal is what the opposition, the Democrats, put out. In your guts, you know he's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting here is that, you know, the, the point here is to, is to bypass the brain, <laughs> right? Um, because complexity equals manipulation. If you have to think about it, then actually there's sort of something wrong with you. You should know in your gut what's, what's right. And this is, you know, this is very um, dangerous at a time when in fact things are becoming more complex, governing is more complex. The idea of arguing that actually you should immediately know where you stand on every issue is actually a very dangerous argument to make. So how did we get to a point where this story has such currency? What happened? Why do we increasingly have receptive targets for the populist message to the extent that they are becoming a major force that is reshaping our political systems and our political landscapes? And I really come from a place where the political landscape is being reshaped by this. So there's a classic story about these parties, right? The classic story is that they are the cry of pain um, of those who have been left behind uh, by, by globalization and who have not been protected against its harsher effects. Some people argue that this is about uh, jobs being wiped out, wages being depressed, uh, the unleashing of giant economic forces, commercial private forces that states and governments have had a difficult time reining in or regulating. And some people argue that this is more about a sense of cultural marginalization, irrelevance, you know, feeling like your values, your preferences are not cosmopolitan enough, not global enough, uh, that your skills are not attuned enough to a knowledge economy and a digital economy, and that you're feeling discarded because of that. Um, I think what's important is that, first of all, we shouldn't separate out these two drives between the cultural and the economic. They, they mesh together. But also what's important here is that it's about heightened anxiety and heightened expectations at the same time. At, just at the point where we expect and need more from our public services or our governments, there's this feeling that perhaps they're not in the best place to deliver uh, what we need. And this creates anxiety for the most vulnerable people. And I'm not saying that the classic story is wrong, but I think that the classic story is incomplete. What we are seeing in the various elections across the Western world is the symptom, I think, of a much deeper, 
more long-term dissatisfaction with our politics, our redistribution, but also how we do politics. And this is important because it needs to shape how we think about what the political solutions are to the kind of mobilization that we're seeing. These populist parties and movements are often unpleasant because they're nativist and sometimes straightforwardly xenophobic and chauvinistic and exclusionary. But I would argue that they are dangerous because they are involved in a more systematic undermining of institutions by creating very polarized debates that make attempts to govern, any attempt to govern, slightly illegitimate. And I know that, you know, I'm saying this in a place of consensus politics, a place where the Progress Party has been in coalition, but you must keep in mind that you are an exception rather <laughs> than the rule on this. In increasingly diverse and complex societies where there has to be compromise, a lot of these parties make compromise and the path to compromise illegitimate. They do that, to do this, they're capitalizing on transformations, disappointment, resentments, to which all of us are vulnerable, and that have been brewing for a while. This is not an epiphenomenon. This is not going to go away, right? And I think that this is important. The power of these movements arose much earlier than the financial crisis or the so-called migrant crisis. And I often hear when I'm in Brussels or I'm in other places, you know, the financial crisis is blamed, migration and migra migrant crisis is blamed, as if somehow once these are resolved, we will go back to normal. We will go back to business as usual. It's not going to happen. We're not going to go back to business as usual. These events, have provided them with more opportunities, but their birth predates these events. And in fact, in many, of, uh, many European countries, this kind of right-wing populism has had some of its major successes long before any of these events actually hit. These opportunities, however, have allowed them to benefit from much deeper and long-lasting transformations that have both helped them mobilize and organize have created a much bigger and interconnected audience, but more importantly, have created the kind of fertile terrain for their cries of direct democracy, radical transparency, immediate solutions um, of policy and political problems. What I'm arguing is that we have been transformed. Some of you might have seen this movie, Her, um, you know, which takes the transformation right into our intimate lives and our conceptions of love. Um, what's interesting is that even though we know we've been transformed, we fail to take seriously these transformations in our institutional life and in our political life. The ubiquity of social media, the way more broadly that digital tools, not just their speed, but also the choice they offer, the exponential access as well, have transformed our expectations of everything, including politics. The growth of digital has modified our behavior. Jaron Lanier uh, argues something like this. He makes a much more um, spiteful, in a sense, argument. You know, he basically says Facebook and Twitter are, have made us more greedy. It's made us more, more resentful, more angry. I simply argue that in combination with the rest of the digital world, it's made us more impatient. And if you're feeling vulnerable and impatient, then populist parties step in. What I see in the focus groups that I run now in comparison to those that I ran 20 years ago is behavior change and expectation change as a result of a digital revolution. We demand different things, we expect different things, and to some extent the speed of the feedback loop between the moment when you purchase something or look up something or dislike something and the reaction of that media to you has actually changed our behavior. It has changed our expectation of speed and choice. Our likes and dislikes are reinforced by commercial and political forces very fast, all the time. Our expectations of that kind of feedback and reactivity 
have infected other parts of our life. My argument here is neither a purely technological one, nor is it one that takes the digital revolution as the source of all evil, not at all. Rather, it is simply based on a realization that we have all of us profoundly changed our expectations and that this is changing politics, but our institutions have not changed to it. They have been the least reactive part of our world. In my forthcoming book, I argue that autonomous access to information of whatever quality, the immediate connection to others, however flimsy, and the acceleration of delivery of goods and information has massively contributed to the creation of three new and fundamental human and citizen drives. A fantasy of radical transparency, things to be simple, accessible, an expectation of immediacy, fast and reliable, and a demand for directness, unmediated and personal and personalized. Think of this as expecting to understand and, every, and receive everything directly and now. Imagine wanting our politicians to behave and react like Amazon Prime. Exactly what I want, when I wanted, no disappointment, fixed price. And it doesn't really matter what anyone else wants or orders, and that's the illusion. This is unlikely in a world where, paradoxically, everyone wants a more tailored public service, more tailored health, more tailored education. Complexity and variety of choice don't go well with simplicity and speed. So these two are on a collision course. This means that in all the research we have carried out at Counterpoint on this topic, one thing is clear. While democracy still very much has currency, representative democracy that requires deliberation no longer really does. Representation is slow, it's cumbersome, it's imperfect, it's unreliable, it's often untransparent, and by definition, it's indirect. The very notion of being represented is one that is becoming increasingly alien in an age of these drives, in an age of diversity. Most of the young people that we work with in focus groups, for example, don't quite grasp how someone else who they don't know and who doesn't know them and who lives far away and who looks and speaks and is different from them could possibly represent them or know them. And in fact, what has fundamentally changed is that they expect to be known, which is something that is actually quite new. The populist offer, especially if one is feeling marginalized by current politics, cultural and economic development, seems to address this. It is direct. It advocates more use of referendums. It pretends that solutions are swift and simple. Let's build a wall. Let's leave the EU. And actually, when you know, these things turn out to be very complicated, voters get angrier. I mean, I do focus groups on Brexit, and I have people saying, well, we voted 18 months ago. Why aren't we out yet? And you kind of think, not only are we not out, you know, we're, we're nowhere at this point, right? It is, it is complex. And actually, what I do see in these groups that we run is that the anger is getting worse and worse, not at Europe, but at a government that is perceived as failing and incompetent. And, you know, we are going to the brink of what is politically uh, feasible. So just to conclude, because I'm, I'm out of time, I'm not a Cassandra. I'm normally, I'm actually quite an upbeat, <laughs> an optimistic person. <laughs> but I really do think that we are at a crossroads um, in the way that we address our institutions and that we address this, the kinds of politics that populist parties and movements are taking us down the road of. You know, one of the things about what they've been able to do is to create this polarization. We need to be able to use these forces that have polarized the debate in many of our countries in order to try and actually build bridges across. And yesterday, you know, we, we were asked whether, us and I were asked whether we thought that maybe, you know, voting reform uh, would help. And, you know, voting reform, you know, might, might 
help. Most citizens aren't particularly interested in reforming the electoral system. We had a referendum on it in the, in the UK. Nobody turned up, and those who turned up voted no. Um, but, you know, it seems to me that this sort of thing is what we would call rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic, right? It's too late for this kind of mini-fix. You know, we need to rethink this in terms of political sentiment. We need to rethink this in terms of the digital forces that we can use and the kinds of activists that we can use to build these bridges across these two Britons, these two Frances, these two Italys, these two Europes, and, and frankly, our two worlds. Thank you.